This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope's rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the next reading in the wonderful book The History of the Inquisition by Philip von Limborch that he wrote in 1692 and that was translated into the English language by Samuel Chandler and published then in 1731, so the beginning of the 18th century. It has been quite a while since I recorded, almost three months uh, between, but you of course don't know that because I uploaded all the parts that I recorded previously, but I have been so much busy with other things that I just couldn't get to this. And uh, then I also discovered I, uh, a new uh, desktop camera, but the problem is that the new desktop camera, my computer cannot process the high resolution. So I went back to Hypercam, the old one that I did that uses files between 20 and 30 gigabytes for an hour recording uh, instead of the new camera. But uh, in this way that I record this, you can at least read along with me. And I think this is more important than just a... Uh, just a good picture, uh, you know. I mean, the picture in this reading of this book is the PDF that I'm reading so that you can read along and here and there I put a picture in like this war of disinformation on my logo, that's all. Anyway, today is the 5th of August 2017 and I pick up the reading again of uh, the history of the Inquisition by Philip von Limborch. Um, also because I want to finish this book and of course I have other uh, projects that I want to pursue. But I love this book very much and I hope that you do too and I hope you're going to read along when we are going to continue right now on page 198 in the PDF. And by the way, uh, maybe that's something I, I, I should tell you. Um, there was one of my listeners who was so kind to leave me a, a link uh, to this book, The History of the Inquisition, in one of the parts that I uploaded. 
and saying that the one that I have here is not so good because it left out a few pages and he gave me another one but the other one that he gave me was really an abridged version and I couldn't find anything of the things that I'm reading right here uh, right now in that book uh, for example the chapter 6 that we are going to start right now in volume 2 uh, in this new uh, version that he gave me has only three and a half pages and uh, in this one that we are reading in, in, in this um, uh, format that you know already well chapter 6 is about at least seven or eight pages but written like you see here the other one that was um, well kind of different so thank you very much for giving me the link to the other version but it seems that I can better go reading this book even though it is not so easy with the S and the F and the old English that it is written in here you understand that for me as a not even native English speaker is not always that uh, easy for me to read but um, I hope that you will come along with me and uh, enjoy the reading of the history of the Inquisition and enjoy I mean in that case that you will understand that understanding the history that is written down in this book is so important to understand the present time that we are living in right now and even to make predictions to the future because we, when we do not understand the real history of the Inquisition and by that the real history of the Roman Catholic Church that the Jesuits hid all the last 500 years when we don't understand that we are so easily deceived you know most of my English speaking brothers and sisters as I might maybe call them are so confused by the futurist lie of the Antichrist that the Jesuits put out there I mean 500 years ago when the Bible first was published in the own language in, in, in English with the Tyndale Bible and the English Bible by Henry VIII and then in the beginning of the 17th century the King James Bible was for more than 200 years the reference in English all over the world that people had and everybody understood that the papacy is the Antichrist and with the Oxford movement and then the charismatic movement and at the end of course the ecumenical movement and the teachings of uh, Jesuit Ribera for the futurist uh, uh, explanation of the Antichrist and uh, yeah you know the Antichrist is just the person that comes seven, year before, seven, seven years before Christ returns well when Christ doesn't say when he returns how can you then <laughs> say the Antichrist returns seven years before Christ because then you would know when Christ returns and that would make Christ a liar right but uh, let, let, let's even go away from that when we do not know our history it is easy to deceive us in the time that we are living now and very easy to deceive us in the time to come and this is the end time these are the last days and we have to know our history and therefore I think the history of the Inquisition is quite important to read but now with any further ado and any more delay <coughs> I will go to the reading and I really like your like to receive some comments of you what you, what you think of this reading what you think of this book and if you learn something from it because that's what's it all about that we all learn and that we all grow in the spirit and that we all grow closer to Jesus Christ away from the Antichrist who rules this world as the Bible says the God of this world is Satan so continuing now on page 198 in the PDF on chapter 6 in volume 2 of the history of the Inquisition called Saint Augustine's opinion concerning the persecution of heretics Augustine in his former writings condemned all violence upon account of religion for writing against the fundamental epistle of the Manichaeus uh, of Manichaeus he begins with his address to the Manichaeans the servant of the Lord ought not to strive etc it is therefore our business willingly to act this part God gives that which is good to those who willingly ask it of him the only rage against you who know nothing of the labor that is necessary to find out truth 
or the difficulty to avoiding errors, tis they who rage against you, who know not how uncommon and difficult it is to overcome carnal imaginations by the calmness of a pious mind. And I highlighted this last part of the sentence because I think this last sentence is a very, very important. Tis they, uh, they who rage against you, they who do not know anything about the labor that is necessary to find out the truth, meaning studying the word of God, or the difficulty of avoiding errors, this they who rage against you, who know not how uncommon and difficult it is to overcome carnal imaginations by the calmness of a pious mind. Carnal imaginations, you know. We are all living in this carnal, in this fleshly body. And we have to put away this fleshly body and try to live in this spirit. Because our Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We cannot, spirit, uh, we cannot worship him with our flesh. We can only worship him spiritually. And we say, therefore we have to overcome carnal imaginations by the calmness of our pious mind. Augustine continues here. "'Tis they who rage against you, who are ignorant how hard it is to heal the eye of the inward man, so that it can behold its S-U-N, its sun, but not that S-U-N, that sun whose celestial body you, the pagans, worship, and which irradiates the fleshly eyes of men and beasts, but that of which the prophet writes, quote, The S-U-N, the sun of righteousness, is arisen on me, unquote and of which we read in the Evangelist, quote, He was that true light which enlightens every man that cometh into the world. Unquote. They rage against you who know not that this by means, sighs and groans we must attain to a small portion of the knowledge of God. Lastly, they rage against you who are not deceived with that error into which they see you are fallen. But as for myself, Augustine, I, who after long and great fluctuation can at last perceive what is that sincerity which is free from all mixture of vain fable, cannot by any means rage against you whom I ought to, to bear with, as I was once born with myself, and so treat you with the same patience that my friends exercised towards me when I was a zealous and blind espouser of your error, actually our common error, the time before we saw the truth. And Augustine admits that here. I had the same error that you have. Means the same error that the people has that he is teaching here right now. And that is the same that goes for me, you know. I was living in the era for 45 years of my life until God finally re re revealed himself to me and gave me the possibility through the Holy Spirit to the understanding of what I have to do in this life to finally come to senses and to finally make something out of my life. And I'm not speaking about going out there and earning money. I'm speaking about going out there and preach the gospel to all the creatures, which is you. Yes, a man is a creature because we are all created. That's where the word comes from. And again, the author continues in his questions upon St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, when the good corn sprung up and brought forth fruit, fruit then appeared the tares also. Now, this is very interesting that is coming right now. For when the spiritual man begins to discern all things, he begins also to discern errors. His servants said to him, Wilt thou that we go and gather the tares? Meaning, the servants, the disciples of Jesus Christ, asked him, Would thou, or wilt thou, that we go and gather the tares? 
are we to suppose that those are the servants whom he calls a little after reapers, which, um, uh, which in the exposition of the parable be expressly faith, uh, he expressly faith to be angels? But who will dare affirm that the angels knew not when who sought the tares, and then first discerned them, when they perceived the fruit come forth? We ought rather to interpret it of faithful men here, signified by the name of servants, whom he also calls the good seed. Nor is it any wonder that the same person should be called the good seed and the servants of the master, since Christ says for himself that he is the gate and the shepherd, for the same thing is represented under many different similitudes, for different reasons. And the rather here, because when he speaks of the servants, he doth not say, When the harvest comes, I will say to you, gather first the tares, but I will speak, says he, to the reapers. So he will not say to you, he will speak to the reapers. From whence we may infer that the gathering the tares to burn them is the business of others and that no son of the church should imagine that it is an office belonging to him. When therefore any person begins to be spiritual, he perceives the errors of the heretics, and judges and discerns everything that he reads or bears to differ from the rule of truth. But until he grows more perfect in the spiritual things and ripens into fruit as the seed did, he may be surprised how so many falsehoods of the heretics should exist under the Christian name. Hence it was that the servant said, Didst thou not sow good seed in this field? Whence then the tares? When at last he comes to know that this is sowing to the subtlety of the devil, who, far from being awed by the authority of so great a name, covers his own falsehoods under it, and may have an inclination to destroy such men out of the world according as he hath opportunity. But whether he ought to do this, and whether it be the duty of men, he consults the justice of God, whether he hath commanded or permits it. Hence the servant said, Wilt thou that we go and gather them? To which the truth itself answered, the condition of man in this life is not such that it can certainly be known what that man afterwards prove, who is now seen to be in a manifest error, or how his error may contribute to the increase of the good, and therefore such are not to be destroyed, lest whilst we endeavour to kill the evil, we also kill the good or such as possibly may hereafter prove so. And lest we hereby prejudice the good, to whom the other may be, though unwillingly useful. But the most proper time for this is at the end of all things, when there will be no farther opportunity of amending the life, or of advancing the truth by the occasion of comparison and of other means uh, of other men's errors. And even then, this is to be done <coughs> not by men, but by the angels. Hence, he continues on the next page, hence it was that the master answers, No, left, the gathering, left gathering the tares, ye pull up also the wheat. But in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, etc., and thus he rendered them the most patient, patient and calm. You understand? It is not on us to make the difference between the good and the bad seed. Let the good seed and the bad seed arise together. And when the time is come, God will send the angels who will be the reapers and will gather the wheat in the barn and burn the tares on the field. 
in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, etc., 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 what we just talked about. But afterwards, upon his sharp and long disputes with the Donatists, though he was so far of the same mind, as that he was not willing to punish them with death, yet he so far altered his opinion, as that he did not disapprove of, but was for actually inflicting all punishments which did not cut off the hopes of repentance, i.e. all manner, death only excepted, that being terrified by them, they might be compelled to embrace the orthodox face which he hath knew, which he has shown in a few words in his second book of Retractions, chapter 5. I have two books entitled against the Donatists. In the first I declared that I did not approve that schismatical persons should be compelled to communion by any secular power. The reason was because I had not then experienced what great mischief would arise from their impunity, nor how much good dis discipline would conduce to their conversion. He argues the same most largely in his 48th letter to Vincentius on account of the Rogation heresy. Quote, this is again from Augustine's work. Huh? We are still speaking about Augustine's work. Quote, My first opinion was that none was to be forced to the unity of Christ. <laughs> I'm still of that opinion. But, he continues, that he was to be dealt with by words, fought with by argument, overcome by reason. Let those who once were open heretics should become feigned Catholics. But I changed my opinion, not from the contradiction of others, but from demonstrative examples. My own city was first alleged, which, though entirely in the heresy of Donatus, was converted to the Catholic unity by fear of the imperial laws, and now so thoroughly detests the pernicious animosity that that one would be apt to believe it had never been infected with it. Many other cities were particularly named to me, so that from hence I understood the meaning of what is written. Give opportunity to a wise man, and he will be wiser. For how many, to our certain knowledge, were willing to become Catholics, convinced by evident truth, but yet deferred, but yet deferred it through fear of offending their friends. How many were held in subjection, not to truth, in which you never had any concern, but to obstinacy and habit, whereby it was fulfilled in them that divine passage, and any uh, and evil servant will not grow better by words, even though he understand he will not obey. How many imagined that the Donatists were the true church, because security had rendered them proud, flothful, and negligent in their inquiries after the Catholic truth? How many were prevented by the false reports and, sl and slanderers from entering into the churches, who gave out that we placed I know not what upon the altar of God? How many thought it indifferent to what party a Christian belonged, and therefore continued Donatists, because they were born in that sect, and no one forced them to forsake it and return to Catholic faith? Now the terror of those laws, by the publication of which kings, and, uh, of which kings serve the Lord with fear, was of such advantage to all these, that they say, some of them, this was what we intended. Blessed be God that he hath given us the occasion of doing it now, and prevented all farther delays. Others say, this we knew to be true. But we were under an unacceptable prop uh, preposition. Or pre preposition yeah. Blessed be God, who hath broke our bonds in sunder, and hath brought us to the bond of peace. Others say, we knew not what the truth was here, neither were we willing to learn it. But fear made us diligent in inquiring after it, being apprehensive that we should leave, uh, that we should lose our temporal employments. 
without gaining any eternal blessings. Blessed be God, who by fear hath cured us of our negligence, so that through terror we have acquired, in, inquired after what in a state of security we should never have seen, uh, never have been careful to have known. Others say, we were afraid to enter through false reports, which we could not know by false unless we entered. Neither should we have entered unless we had been forced. Blessed be God, who hath taken away our fear by the rod, and given us to understand how vain and lying the reports are which have been raised of this church, of his church. Hence we believe all those things to be false, which the authors of this heresy have raised, since their followers have spread much greater falsehoods. Others say, we thought it signified nothing of whatever party we were Christians. But blessed be God who hath brought us from the schism, and shown us that disagreeable to the one God, that he should be worshipped in unity. Well, this is of course a sentence the Roman Catholic Church abuses. Yeah? Especially since the ecumenical movement. Let's read it again to gain the good understanding. What does the Roman Catholic Church abuse here? But blessed be God who hath brought us from the schism and shown us that disagreeable to the one God that he should be worshipped in unity. Yes, God wants unity. But God does not, want, does not want unity by compromise. Does, God does not want unity in error. God wants only the unity in truth. And that is the problem with the whole ecumenical movement. That is the problem with the Roman Catholic Church. They promote unity... We are all one, we are all brothers and sisters, everything is fine, and the Muslim is as good as the Christian, as good as the Buddhist, as good as the Hindu, and so on, and so on, and so on. The problem is, God wants to be worshipped, as I said already in the beginning of this video, in spirit and in truth. Unity in truth. If there is no truth, there cannot be any unity. And the unity that the Roman Catholic Church is preaching, the unity that the ecumenical movement is teaching, is not based on the Word of God, on the Bible. Is not the unity that is taught in the world, is not based on truth. And that was already in that way in the writings of Augustine. That's why we read this about here. Blessed be God who hath brought us from the schism and shown us that it is agreeable to the one God that he should be worshipped in unity when the unity is in truth. That's that little sentence that misses here. I hope you get it. Should I therefore, Augustine continues, should I therefore oppose myself to the colleagues in preventing methods too gainful of the Lord, and thereby hinder the gathering into the sheepfold of peace, where there is one flock and one shepherd, the strayed sheep of Christ who now wander in the mountains and hills, i.e. in the swellings of their pride? Ought I to oppose such as provision as this, for fear of your losing the things you call your own? Whilst if you were free from fear, you would prescribe even Christ himself? Have you a liberty of making wills by the Roman law, and ought you to destroy by infamous charges the will delivered by God to the fathers, in which it is written, In thy seed shall all nations be blessed? Should you be allowed to make free contracts in buying and selling, and yet dare to divide amongst yourselves what, he betray, uh, what the betrayed Saviour bought for us? Is it just that your donations to others should be valid? And should not what God hath given to his children be firm? 
whom he hath called from the rising of the sun to the setting of it? Can it be unjust to banish you from the land of your body, when you endeavor to banish Christ from the kingdom of his blood, from sea to sea, from river to the utmost bounds of the world? No, let the kings of the earth serve Christ, even by making laws for Christ. Let the kings of the earth serve Christ, and not Antichrist. From these words of Austin, or Augustine, it appears clearer than the light that, the approve, that he approved of the punishments ordained by civil laws against the Iranians, as they ought not to make wills, nor buy and sell, nor receive legacies, but that they should be sent into banishment. And to show that he thought this punishment just upon the Donatist and Rogations, he adds, quote, The terror of temporal powers, when it opposes the truth, is a glorious trial to the good and resolute, but a dangerous temp temptation to the weak. But when it inculcates in incul Sorry, but when it inculcates the truth upon the erroneous and schismatical, to ingenious minds it is an useful admonition, but to the foolish it proves an unprofitable affliction. Unquote. There is no power but what is of God, and he that resists the power resists the ordinance of God. For princes are not a terror to them that do well, but to those who do ill. Wilt thou not therefore fear the power? Do well, and thou shalt have praise from it. Yes, and what I've just read to you is a much abused part of Romans 13 still today. But we have to take one very important point into consideration. Romans 13 says that all power is ordained by God. And that when you resist the power, you resist God. We read here, there is no power but that which is of God. And he that resists the power resists the ordinance of God. Okay. But it also said a little bit earlier here in this, first, in this quote of Augustine, the terror of the temporal powers when it opposes the truth, is a glorious trial of the good and resolute. The terror of the temporal powers when it opposes the truth. Now the point is, you have to take into consideration that there never was a God-fearing and only His laws obeying human government. Means, there is no power, there is no temporal power in this earth that is built upon the laws of the God of the Bible. Therefore, all these powers, even though ordained by God, they do not punish the bad and do good to the good. They are doing the actual opposite. And that's the problem of the world that we are living in. The government takes your money and gives it to people or corporations or institutions of their own choice. You don't have the choice. So when you are able to make a distinction between good and evil because you have the Bible as your conscience-based, then you can make a better decision what to do with your money than the government who is working for the Antichrist. I hope you understand what I'm telling you right now. I mean, we are going here from Augustine, we are really going into Romans 13, and Romans 13 is so often misused by the powers that rule us today, the temporal powers that rule us today, because they say, we are ordained by God. Yeah, but you are ordained by the God of this world, and the God of this world is Satan, and not the God of the Bible. That's a very, very big difference. Okay? Wilt thou not therefore fear the power? Do well, and thou shalt have praise from it. Well, 
when I'm doing well according to the temporal power of the country that I'm living in, I am going against the word of God. Because they turn the law of the God of the Bible 180 degrees around. Do well and thou shalt have praise from it. Yes, if the temporal power that I have to serve is the temporal power that really works according to the laws of the Bible. To the laws of the creator God of the Bible. Not otherwise. But Augustine continues here, For if the power favoring the truth corrects anyone, he who is made better by it hath praise from it. I agree. Or if in opposition to the truth it rages against anyone, he who is crowned conqueror hath praise from it. But as, far, uh, but as for thee, thou sh dost not well, thou dost not well, that thou should not fear the power. Unquote. And to make this appear, he largely refutes his opinion, and uh, and then thinks he hath evidenced the justice of the persecution raised against them. And in the former part of his letter, he argues that they ought to be compelled to return to the church, not by reason only, but by terrors. For, says he, if they should be terrified and not taught, it would seem to be the exercise of an unjust power over them, and if they were taught and not terrified, their old habits would harden them, and they would, have, uh, would move more slowly into the way of salvation. The like may be read in this 50th epistle to Boniface, a military man of Caesar's retinue. A person in a raging frenzy can't bear the physician, nor a libertine son his father, the one because he is bound and the other because he is chastised, both because they are loved. But if they neglect them and suffer them to perish, tis a false and cruel mildness, for the horse and the mule who have no understanding bite and strike at those who handle them to cure their wounds, who, yet, though they are they are of uh, oftentimes in danger and sometimes receive mischief don't leave them till by medical smart and pains they have made them found how much less ought one man to be given up by another a brother by his brother let he perish eternally when after correction he might be brought to understand how great a benefit was conferred on him even when he was complaining of suffering persecution. Therefore, as the Apostle says, let us do good all as we have opportunity. Let those that can do it by discourses of the Catholic precepts, other by the laws of Catholic princes, that they all may be called to salvation and recovered from destruction, partly by those who obey divine admonitions and partly by those who obey imperial commands. When the emperors may make bad laws in favor of falsehood against the truth, true believers are approved and those who persevere are crowned with victory. Now, this very first part of this last sentence I think is very important to understand. Let us have a look at this. When the emperors make bad laws in favor of falsehood against the truth. Now, the problem is, and please let me get that, that you understand this correctly. When the emperors or the government make bad laws in favor of falsehood against the truth, I can only know that when I know the truth. And that's the problem. The people are following the laws of the government in every state that they are living in because they think this government is actually doing good. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not because the government does not base its laws and its rule on the law of God, but on the law of man.
the government is serving the devil and not God. The sentence is so important when the emperors make bad laws in favor of falsehood against the truth. True believers are approved and those who preserve are crowned with victory. Emperors do not make any laws but bad laws, let me tell you. But when they ordain good laws for the truth and opposition to error, the unruly are terrified and the wise amended. He therefore who refuses to obey the imperial laws when made against the truth of God acquires a great reward. Bang! That's the point. That's the point. Read this again. He therefore who refuses to obey the imperial laws when made against the truth of God acquires a great reward. But that does not mean rebellion. That does not mean revolution. That does not mean using violence. It's just that he who refuses to obey the imperial laws or the laws of the secular government, when these laws are made against the truth of God, he acquires a great reward. Well, that reward is paid by God himself. He who refuses to obey, when made for support of divine truth, exposes himself to most grievous punishment. For in the times of the prophets all those kings are blamed, who did not forbid and abolish everything contrary to the divine precepts, and those who did are highly commanded. Even King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, when he was a servant of idols, made an impious law that the image should be worshipped. But those who did not obey his wicked constitution acted piously and faithfully. And yet the same king changed by a divine miracle made a pious and commandable law for the truth, that whosoever that whoever should blaspheme the true God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego should be destroyed with his whole house. Those who despised his law uh, the, uh, those who despised uh, this law and deservedly suffered the penalty of it might yet say what these do, what, uh, that they were righteous persons, because persecuted by the king's law, which they might say as well, if they were as mad as those who divide the members of Christ, destroy the sacraments of Christ, and yet glory in persecution, because they are forbidden to do these things by the imperial laws made for the unity of Christ. They vainly boast of their innocence and seek the glory of martyrdom from men, which they cannot receive from the Lord. After which he subjoins a long discourse to prove that all who suffer persecution are not martyrs, but such only who suffer for righteousness, and that all persecutors are not of the false church. For Agar suffered persecution from Sarah, and yet he who persecuted was holy, and she who suffered persecution unholy. And a little after, it's all Augustine saying, if therefore we will acknowledge the truth, that is an unjust persecution which the wicked made on the church of Christ, and that a just persecution which the churches of Christ make on the wicked, so that the church is blessed which suffers persecution in righteousness sake, for righteousness sake, and they miserable uh, and they miserable and suffer persecution for unrighteousness. Besides, the church persecutes by love, they by rage. She, the church, that she may correct, they in order to overthrow. She, that she may recall from error, they to enforce others into it. She persecutes and apprehends enemies to cure them from their vanity, and that they may advance in the truth, they return evil for good, and because we consult 
their eternal salvation endeavor to deprive us from our temporal safety. And afterwards he continues, this an instance of mercy to them because by, the, by these imperial laws they are snatched, though against their wills, from that sect where they have learned their errors from the doctrines of devils that they may be healed by being accustomed to sound doctrines and manners in the Catholic Church. For many of those whose previous fervor of faith and charity and the unity of Christ we now admire give thanks to God with great gladness that they are not now in the error to think those evil things good, which thanks they would never have willingly unless they had been forced unwillingly to depart from, the accursed, from that accursed society. As to the objection that the apostles never desired much methods from the kings of the earth, he answers that none of the emperors then believed in Christ and therefore could not, could not serve him by making laws for godliness against impiety. But afterwards, when that began to be fulfilled, which is written, all the kings of the earth shall worship him, all nations shall serve him, what person in his wits would then thus address himself to kings? It doth not concern you who in our dominions defends, sorry, who in your dominions defends or opposes the church of our Lord, who will be religious or impious. May it not as well be said, it is nothing to you who in your dominions is chaste or lewd? For since God hath, hath given to all men freedom of will, why should adulteries be punished by law and sacrileges permitted? Here Augustine outs himself as a Roman Catholic. For since God hath given to all men freedom of will, F free will is a pagan teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. God did not give us free will. We have a free choice. That's not the same thing. Free will is a Roman Catholic false teaching. We have presupposition. We have pre-election. God chooses. God selects. It's God's will that is done, not our will. If we had free will, God's will, we could not surrender to God's will be done. How do we say that in the Lord's Prayer? Thy will be done as in heaven and on earth, not our will. If we have free will, then our will goes against the will of God. That's not the point. But maybe that's something that I cannot explain that... <laughs> uh, with that deep meaning that I could explain that in German so maybe my words are a little bit short of that but God has not given to all men freedom of will because free will is a Roman Catholic heresy but Augustine is a Roman Catholic I think you get that already from what he says here right he mixes a lot of truth with error right it is the preservation of the soul's fidelity to God of less importance than a woman's to her husband or because those things which are done not from any contempt of religion but merely through ignorance are to be more gently uh, uh, anim anim animadverted on uh, it's a word I don't understand are they therefore to be entirely neglected who doubts whether it be better to draw men to the worship of God by argument than to compel them with the fear of punishment or pain. Yeah, that's a very good point Augustine makes here. Let's read this again. Who doubts 
whether it be better to draw men to the worship of God by argument than to compel them with the fear of punishment or pain. This is the whole this is a summary of the whole uh, whole problem of the Inquisition, of the whole summary of the policies of the Roman Catholic Church, which says, convert or die. You know? Who doubts whether it be better to draw men from worship by, to go of God by argument, by the word of God, than to compel them with the fear of punishment or pain? That's exactly the policy of the Roman Catholic Church. Convert or die. Instead of using arguments like we Christians do, we open our Bible and we say, read this, read this, read this, read this, and here you can see what God speaks to you. Don't you think that you can be drawn to God when you just understand what he says to you? Or do I have to use violence? Do I have to use fear? Do I have to use punishment? That's the big difference between real Christians and the so-called Roman Catholic Christians. Because the Roman Catholic Christians draw men to God by fear of punishment and pain. And real Christians draw people to God and worship the God of the Bible by argument. And the argument is the word. The word of the Bible, the 1611 authorized version, King James Bible. But Augustine continues here, but doth it follow that because those who are won by reason are the best, that therefore others to be wholly disregarded? <laughs> he really makes a difference here, by the way, how you have been brought to God. And I tell you that when you are brought to God by the fear of punishment and pain, that is not the God of the Bible. And there is the big difference. So the sentence actually doesn't make any sense when you understand it correctly. But does it follow that because those who are won by reason are the best, that therefore others are to be wholly disregarded? We can produce many instances to prove of how great advantage compulsion by fear and pain have been, they having hereby rendered open instruction or excited to the practice of what they have been taught. And afterwards, to what purpose do these men cry out when are free either to believe or not to believe? To whom did Christ use violence? Whom did he force? Now, he cites now the Apostle Paul. Very careful, because the Apostle Paul is very often abused by quote-unquote church fathers as Augustine. I produce the Apostle Paul, he says. Let them own that Christ first forced and afterwards taught him, first struck and then comforted him. It is wonderful to consider how he who, forced by bodily punishment, first entered into the gospel, labored in it more abundantly than all they who by the word only were called to believe on it. But how much greater his fear was that forced his love by so much the more perfect was his love and cast out, that cast out fear. When they should not, sorry, this, uh, when, why then, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I read this wrong here. Why then should not be justice, uh, should not the church compel her lost sons to return, since these lost sons have compelled others to their destruction? especially as the Holy Mother more kindly embraces those who, having been not, such, not so much compelled as seduced, are made to return by terrible, uh, by terrible though loathsome laws into her bosom, and rejoices over them much more than over those she never had lost. 
Uh, he is working so subtly here and replacing Mary with Christ that you really have to pay very good attention. Especially as the Holy Mother more kindly embraces Lord. Uh, who is the Holy Mother? I never read in the Bible of a Holy Mother. So what the... What is Augustine talking about here? Very, very careful we have to be. What? Doth it not belong to the pastoral care to recover those sheep when found to the Lord's flock by the terror of stripes or even pain if they resist, which having been violently snatched away, have wandered from the flock through soft and gentle persuasion? I hope that you understand this because here Augustine absolutely comes out as a Roman Catholic. The only truth where people are even forced to be in is the truth of the Roman Catholic Church. Especially as the quote-unquote Holy Mother, as he says here. Well, what's the Holy Mother? The Mother Church, right? The Roman Catholic Church, right? So this quote-unquote church father, Augustine, is so subtle in his writings that we read here. That first you could say, oh, he is right here, oh yeah, he is right there, then he's probably everywhere, right? Here you can see, here you can see how wrong he is. What does it not belong to? What? Doth it not belong to the pastoral care to recover those sheep when found to the Lord's flock by the terror of stripes or even pains if they resist? So what does he say here? He advocates violence to get people back to the Lord's flock. Jesus Christ never used any violence. And now you can say, well, but what did he do with Saul on the road to Damascus before he became Paul? Was that violence? No. He punished him for what he did. And he showed him what he is going to do in the future. And he proved that he was really having a understanding with Jesus Christ by taking his sight away and even more so by giving it back what does it not belong to the pastoral care to recover those sheep when sound <coughs> when found to the lord's flock by the terror of stripes or even pains no what did we just read before in the in the page before here let's go back to it we read here um, who doubts whether it be better to draw men to the worship of God by argument than to compel them with the fear of punishment and, or pain? Now he contradicts himself in the very next page. You see that? Because there he advocates violence. And a few lines afterwards, Augustine continues... Because they cannot show that they are compelled to evil, they argue that they ought not to be compelled even to what is good. But we have shown that Paul was compelled by Christ so that the church imitates its Lord in compelling those first waiting before, the compel, before, the, before she compels any, that the preaching of the prophets might be fulfilled with respect to the faith of kings and nations. For to this purpose may for to this purpose may be understood that of blessed Paul having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your dis uh, when your obedience is first fulfilled. Hence also our Lord himself first commands the guests to be invited and afterward compelled to his great supper. For when the servants answered him, Lord, it is done as thou commandest, and yet there is room, he said, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. 
Now in those who were first kindly brought in is fulfilled the first obedience. In those who were compelled the disobedience is revenged. For what is this compelled for what is this compel them to come in when this first said bring in? And the answer was it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. If he would have if he would have it understood of being compelled by the terror of miracles, those were done in great in greatest abundance on behalf of of those who were first called, especially of those of whom to set the Jews seek signs. The like may be read into his, into his 204th epistle to Donatus, a Donatist presbyter, in which he relates the various cruelties of the Donatists and Circumcilians, and writes that many were reduced to the unity of the Church by the laws made against them. After a long account of this, he answers an objection to the Donatist, of the Donatists that the Catholics coveted and took away their goods and shows the falsehood of it. See also his 116th epistle on the Donatists. From whence we may see that Austin of Augustine hath very fully taught and endeavoured by many arguments to prove that heretics ought to be compelled to return to the church by eternal violence and the fear of punishments, though he was not willing that they should be put to death. So it's okay to punish, it's okay to, to, uh, to strike a person, to do harm to a person, to convince them to come back to your church. It's not okay to kill them. Okay, there we draw the line. But you can punish them. It means you can use the Inquisition. So Augustine was in favor of the Inquisition when you read this correctly. From whence we may see that Austin hath very fully taught and endeavored by many arguments to prove that heretics ought to be compelled to return to the church by external violence and the fear of punishments, though he was not willing that they should be put to death. Okay, he draws the line before killing, but he says we can use external violence and the fear of punishments to bring them back to the church. That is not the church of Jesus Christ, people. That is the Roman Catholic Church. This is advocating inquisition because the inquisition was nothing else than try to get people by the by, by violence and the fear of punishments and even the punishments to get them to the belief system of the roman catholic church the belief system of the devil the god of this world we really have to understand this and I think the farther we read this year, the more that we understand that Augustine really shows his true colors from here. And I will leave it for here because I already read about an hour. And we will continue on page 36 next time. So that means we have at least read six pages. That's already something. It was not that easy for me. I think you understood that. <laughs> But I'm sorry, I just don't have the time to read this in advance. I'm reading this the first time here, but my understanding also gains here. But Augustine was not a true Jesus Christ following Christian. He was a Roman Catholic. And we see this more and more with every word we read here in this chapter 6 of the history of the Inquisition by Philip from Limburg. So I thank you all very much for listening and watching this video, for commenting and coming back. And, you know, do your own studies. I'm just here to try to help you and show you what you can read to learn and gain understanding. In the first place, very easy, read your Bible. Read the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Read and study the Word of God. And then, be busy with lectures like these that try to teach real history. Until next time, Juggler66 from All of the Truth says, God bless you and bye-bye. 
We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.